everybody. Uh, let us start with the third uh, sense about the, the course about the Manila Cardinal Chimu by Professor uh, Okay. Um, so the last time I ended up with basic regularity results for uh, solutions to measure data problems. <coughs> and in particular, we have seen that uh, when you have an elliptic equation with a right hand side being the measure, for instance, if you if you have a D Laplacian, and this is a formal measure with finite total mass. And more in general, if you have an elliptic equation, a present linear elliptic equation of this type, whose uh, growth and elliptic properties are probably modeled on the p Laplacian one, so that's the model example for this larger class, then we have two basic regularity results. We have that u belongs to Marcintevich and p minus 1 and minus 1, and this is optimal. And this is essentially due to Mokhari and Galoué. So there exists actually a solar solution obtainable as a lineage of approximate solutions and joining this type of uh, higher integrability. And the second result is that the u belongs to w, 1 minus epsilon p minus 1, p minus 1, and uh, everything is locked here um, for every epsilon 0, 1. And this is due to myself, let's say, more or less 10 years ago. So essentially, this is, uh, these are the maximal regularity results you can expect from solutions, as it is uh, certified by the so-called nonlinear Green's function. Uh, OK, now we, I'm going to go a bit deeper in the regularity and in the fine properties of solutions to measure data equations. Therefore, we go into that branch of regularity theory, which is called nonlinear potential theory. And this is about uh, a proper nonlinear generalization of the classical potential theory dealing with fine properties of harmonic functions and uh, uh, linear and solutions to linear elliptic and eventually parabolic equations. Okay, so let me very uh, let me restart where I really where I really began. Uh, at, the, at, the, at, the very, at the very beginning of this course. So we start with the Poisson equation. The Poisson equation is the, I mean, it's the prototype for all these linear equations. And uh, we know that u can be expressed as the convolution with the classical Green's function. The Green's function <coughs> is the, the following one. Essentially, you can get uh, uh, you can consider the unique solution decaying at zero at infinity. Is there another problem? Okay, as I was saying, uh, you can easily get u in a standard way via convolution with the fundamental solution, and the fundamental solution is the following one. Okay, uh, as an immediate consequence, just by differentiation under the sign of integral, you see that, okay, let's just focus on the case and strictly larger than 2. Um, you get this bound via what we have seen being the risk potential, the I2 risk potential. And then differentiating under the sign of integral, then you get a pointwise bound uh, via I1, the I1 risk potential. OK. So once you know these two properties, you actually know a lot about solution, uh, about solutions, because uh, the behavior of, uh, of risk potential is perfectly of risk potentials is perfectly known. <coughs> For instance, all the integrability properties they follow at once because the, the mapping properties in the rearrangement in variant function spaces of risk potentials is something which is classical. Uh, therefore, you know essentially everything. So you forget that u is a solution of an equation. You just look at the mapping properties of risk potentials, and that's it. OK, this approach is obviously possible for linear equations, <laughs> or whenever you have a, a fundamental solution that allows you to get other solutions via, via convolution. It is obviously not clear that this can still hold for nonlinear equations like this. So the purpose of the next lectures is to show that actually there are perfectly, perfectly um, good analogs of these two estimates for, that work for quasi-linear equations as well, reproducing the whole theory. 
uh, in its essential points. Okay, for this, let me first introduce the so-called truncated risk potential. There's no trick here. There's, this is, I mean, this just uh, should just be thought as a, another way to write the risk potential. So the risk potential, the truncated risk potential is this quantity. Uh, you see here the higher measure with respect to the product in Rn. And that's nothing but um, the risk potential uh, when you restrict the domain of integration, not on the whole, you don't consider the whole Rn as the domain of integration, but you just restrict on a ball with radius r centered at x. Uh, this is just the risk potential, I mean, uh, of the, the standard risk potential of the measure uh, um, when, you, when you restrict on dr. And therefore, this is less than or equal than the risk potential. So this is just uh, this should, should just be considered as the usual risk potential, but when you but uh, restricting the domain of integration of a small ball. Uh, why am I using these potentials? Because the truncated risk potentials they actually they naturally come up when you are considering equations not on the whole Rn but on bounded domains, and you want to have local estimates instead of I mean estimates on the whole domain. Okay. So these are the, the problems I'm going to talk about. And um, the first thing is that I will consider so-called nonlinear Poisson equations. So I still consider non-degenerate elliptic equations. But these equations have still, uh, uh, are still nonlinear. <coughs> and here, the real passage is from linear to nonlinear. Because uh, the, the point is that we want to, we want to, to see uh, that certain type of results that are apparently um, completely linear are actually nonlinear. So the real point is jumping from linear to nonlinear case. And eventually, you can consider also the, 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 the degenerate case. So uh, from a conceptual viewpoint, many of the difficulties and of the novelties are already considered uh, in the nonlinear case when t is equal to 2. Then eventually, we want to consider more difficult situations, and then we go to we go to, uh, to the possibly, the potentially degenerate setting. Uh, um, a remark, everything I'm going to talk about for degenerate equations, I will uh, very often stay for the model case, but everything works for, for elliptic equations of this type where you replace these assumptions by the degenerate ones. OK. So, the, uh, um, so it is absolutely standard, and this is the standard orthodoxy of nonlinear uh, potential theory, um, uh, is, the, is the fact that when you, when you uh, go from p equals to 2 to the generate equations, you have to replace risk potentials by booth potentials. Booth potentials are the object introduced here. They're being uh, first considered in a um, very fundamental paper of Abing and Mazial from 72. And you see that both potentials and risk potentials are essentially the same thing, but the first one is nonlinear because it incorporates the scaling deficit of the equation. If you, if you consider this equation, of course, and you see that if you multiply u by a constant, then, uh, then you do not have, uh, if you multiply u by a constant, then you see that this still solves an equation, but with a constant to this exponent. 1 or p minus 1, because this case is like 1 and this case is like p minus 1. So uh, the booth potential is nothing but the risk potential um, made nonlinear by incorporating a power which is the scaling deficit of the equation. So there's no, essentially, no surprise here. So once you recognize this is risk potential, the booth potential comes, comes along in a natural way, and the standard orthodoxy of nonlinear potential theory is that booth potentials replace risk potentials uh, I mean, wherever, whenever you're doing anything. This is the standard way of doing it. Okay, then there is this uh, fundamental result of Kipelani and Mali that tells you that if you have uh, such an equation, or if you have a more general elliptic equation of this type, <coughs> of this type, then you can pointwise bound the solution via the booth potential as it were linear. And in fact, you see that this is doubling one p, and when p is equal to two, this is exactly i two. Of course, there is this additional term, which is with capital R fixed a constant. It must be there because it takes into account the fact that you have a local estimate. It must be there because you see when capital R goes to zero, 
then uh, this guy goes to zero, provided it is finite, because it, it is an integral. And therefore, this is the absolute continuity of the integral. And therefore, you have u less than or equal than itself, as it must be. <coughs> on the other end, if you have a decent, I mean, decay properties, and you are on the whole other end, you let capital I go to plus infinity, and this disappears, provided, for instance, u is integrable or it decays fast. And this is a very striking result, which, is, which has been cooked up by, by a suitable I mean, uh, application of the George's iteration technique. And uh, essentially, this allows to reduce the theory uh, to the analysis of, uh, of, a, of a potential exactly as in the linear case. Why? Because the behavior of risk potentials and both potentials is known. Why the, poten why the behavior of both potentials is known? Because both potentials can be controlled by a nonlinear iteration uh, of, uh, of uh, risk potentials. And for instance, this mapping property is, is well known. For instance, you know if mu is in a certain L2 space, you know where the both potential is. And therefore, you can just forget, you can just forget uh, that the fact that u is a solution and you can recover all the integrability properties by the fact that you have a bound here, the risk potential. So the first bound, let me rewrite down here, is the following one. You take a ball, and then you can point twice bound your x less than or equal. Of course, there will be constants here, W1P, x capital R plus u, something like this. You let capital I being fixed, and therefore you get this estimate. So if you know where mu is, then you know where u is, essentially because the mapping properties of both potentials are known. And these are known because, and this is a, a very basic property first pointed out by Abi and Mazia, you can control the risk potential, especially when you go to plus infinity, but then you can also localize this easily uh, via a nonlinear iteration of uh, risk potentials. In turn, since the behavior of risk potentials is known, then you can re easily recover the behavior of both potentials. Uh, observe that this inequality is actually a double-sided inequality for p larger than 2 minus 1 over n. So in particular, when p is larger than 2, and I'm very often restricting to this case, when p is larger than 2, you have a complete uh, I mean, equivalence between both potentials and this object on the right hand side, which is often called having Mazia potential. So this is nothing but the having Mazia potential. So essentially, this fundamental theorem of Kipelangen and Mali um, uh, allows to, to, to reconstruct the, the theory of, uh, of uh, the integrability and regularity properties of U, uh, starting from the, the right hand side mu via potentials, exactly as you do for the linear case. OK, so now we talk about the gradient estimate. And we want to do something similar for the gradient. OK, uh, the, the, the problem of discovering a, a nonlinear analog for the gradient has, been, has remained open since the paper of Kipelain and Mali. And oh, by the way, this is the, the very famous paper of Abing and Mazia. It's published in 72. In, uh, I don't know if it's uh, Maths Morning or something like that. It's oh, Russian Math Surveys, one of the two. It's a very long paper where they really establish the fundamentals of uh, nonlinear potential theory, as you can see from the title. OK. The problem of, uh, of establishing uh, um, uh, an analog for the gradient has been, uh, uh, has been remained open since the paper of, uh, uh, of, uh, of I mean, Kirpelang and Mali, and it's, it has been debated a lot because uh, there has been some belief of someone that such an estimate could not be true, essentially because, uh, 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 because Kirpelang and Mali also proved the following fact, and they prove, in fact, that this estimate is sharp. They prove that if mu is positive, and uh, by maximum principle u is positive, then you can also put, let's say, a W1P potential here on the left hand side. So this is clearly not possible. So it's a double it's a double sided estimate for positive solutions that tells you that any solution is trapped via is trapped by two two move potentials. And uh, this estimate obviously fails for the gradient because the gradient can be flat. 
and deflect it where you respond to the process. Okay, so uh, the first result has been obtained by myself in, uh, in a few years ago. Actually, the paper is from 2008, <laughs> and uh, by backlog reasons, was, uh, publication was delayed, and tells you exactly what you expect. When p is equal to 2, so you have a nonlinear Poisson equation, so you have, um, you have an equation <coughs> with the electricity properties are formulated in the following way. Essentially, this is the electricity property. And then you can point twice bound du via I1. du via I1. Um, in particular, for W11 solutions or for solutions such that this object is going to zero when capital I goes to, to Capital I goes to plus infinity, then you recover the usual estimate, and this is true provided in particular this is satisfied by very many solutions with measured data, for instance you take the direct measure. So you can um, amazingly reconstruct the, the, the classical estimate that works for the Laplacian via convolution with the fundamental solution for any quasi-linear nonlinear uh, equation. Okay, what about the P case? So what about, the, for instance, the P-Laplacian equation? Okay, for the P-Laplacian equation, a first result has been obtained by Frank Duzal and myself. Uh, a couple of, mm, uh, some, somehow later, and uh, this tells that uh, the U can be pointwise bounded by W1P. P. This is uh, the result, and apparently this uh, closes the issue because uh, it follows, it perfectly follows the, the, the orthodoxy of the nonlinear potential theory in, sen in the sense that whenever you have a Ries potential, then you want to go to a Wolf potential, and then when you get a Wolf potential, then you're happy with that because that's, that's what you expect. The W1PP is, the, is this object, and once again you recognize that when P is equal to 2, you get the, the previous estimate because you get the risk potential. So this apparently closed, uh, closed the issue. Uh, uh, but but for, then there was, a, there was a first twist because for P less than 2, we couldn't get the same estimate, we got, we, we got a worse estimate. And the worst estimate was that we could bound du by i1 to this object. And uh, when p is less than 2, this is a worse estimate. But this is, a, uh, let's say, um, an interesting estimate. Because this estimate tells you that you can pointwise bound du via risk potential as it were linear. Nevertheless, this is worse than, uh, than the previous estimate. Why? Because uh, this is W1P P, and this is this guy. This starts, this you can decompose as a series, and then you can use Hilbert's inequality because now this guy is less than, uh, is uh, let's say larger than one, and then you can get this equivalent. So there was a, there was a point here in getting risk potentials for P less than two. So we get two estimates up to now. And uh, we get, uh, this was the, the, the status, but then uh, there's no reason why if something pops up for P less than 2, it should not pop up 2 for the case P larger than 2. So uh, at this stage, we have two estimates. The first one, which is W1P mu plus integral average. And the second one, and this is for P larger or equal than 2, and this is for P less than 2, Less than or equal than I1 mu to the y over p minus 1 plus the integral of mu. <coughs> this is worse than this one when p is less than 2. On the other hand, this, look, this would be better than this one when p is larger than 2. By essentially the other reasons. Okay, um, so, and now uh, we twist the viewpoint and we make the, the following uh, very crazy uh, ansatz. So we decompose the P-Laplacian operator, the P-Laplacian equation in this way, formally in this way. So if we decompose formally in this way, we have uh, that the P-Laplacian equation can be now split 
in two equations. This is the equation I have in mind. So now I decompose in the following way. Now V is that object, is the so-called stress tensor. And uh, now let's, let me concentrate on this object. Formally, how do you solve this one? This, this equation can be solved in infinitely many ways. For instance, there's a nice paper by Paradise of Morgan that shows this, how it can be solved. But essentially, what you do in a classical way by Bogoski's theorem, you want to integrate uh, both sides. If you integrate, um, integrating means applying your risk potential, I1. So there, formally speaking, the natural analysis tells you that if you have this equation, and then if you apply I1 to both sides, then this is I1 of mu, and this is V. So you believe in an estimate, which is the following one. But in the case B is exactly that object, then this will give you u to the p minus 1, which is the estimate that uh, uh, actually we believe we, we discovered too old in case B less than 2. So this, uh, I mean, this completely crazy, as in, uh, I mean, heuristic argument tells you that you can pointwise bound <laughs> du to the p minus 1, pointwise by the risk potential, as it were linear. And this would go completely against the standard orthodoxy of nonlinear potential theory, because nonlinear potential theory tells you that whenever p is different than 2, then you have to go to good potentials. But this tells you that you can control uh, the gradient via a risk potential as the problem it were, were linear. And this would be, this would mean, uh, I mean, to linearize the equation in a, in a sense. Okay, this uh, was a, a conjecture that, uh, that I had for some while, and, um, and actually was uh, considered to be also somehow hilarious. But uh, uh, this is the point where Tuomo Pusi starts coming into the play, and we prove together with Tuomo that this is actually true. So you can point twice bound, also for p larger than 2, and this is the non trivial case, du by i1. So we can completely linearize the equation. And this estimate uh, essentially takes the whole, um, I mean, the generative theory and uh, brings it back to the linear case. So at this stage, now, every fine property of the gradient can be obtained by risk potentials as it were really a linear equation. And this still holds for general equations, of course. Um, in particular, we have the following thing, that if you, is in W11, but much less if it decays in the way I, I showed you before, it decays at infinity, then you get the following point wise in the board. And this takes the theory and uh, brings it back to the linear one. It linearizes the theory up to the, up to the <coughs> Lipschitz, Lipschitz regularity, because Lipschitz regularity is the best you can get from this estimate. <coughs> In particular, you can, get, you can obtain all the, results, uh, by all the results about integrability and regularity of solutions uh, uh, just uh, studying the risk potential. And this is... Uh, uh, and advance. Later on, Chanky and Mazia proved the global version of uh, this estimate considered an, an integral operator, which is the rearrangement on the right hand side of the risk potential. This is the pointwise, real pointwise version. Okay, this essentially closed the issue, and uh, let me observe that this estimate is better than the Wolf estimate. <coughs> the first estimate we obtained was the Wolf one, but this estimate for P large and 2, it's better than the Wolf estimate. Because essentially what you're having on the right hand side in the case of Wolf estimate is this one, and this one for p larger than 2 is larger or equal than i1 mu to the 1 over p minus 1 for the other reasons of, or with the similar reasons of given by, by, by the previous series in the world. Okay, now we go to very recent results about the vectorial case because uh, all uh, these estimates starts, started, I mean, starting by the Kiefer-Lang and Malice one uh, are valid for equations. And of course, you want to know what happens in the vectorial case. And in the vectorial case, you immediately see that you have difficulties. And um, you have difficulties. And uh, just let me, um, you have difficulties because all these estimates are, in some sense, the estimates for you at least are linked to the maximum principle. And the maximum principle completely fails for, for systems. 
So even the estimate for u was an open problem in the vectorial case. And uh, this started, uh, this since the paper of Kippen, and Mali, and now recently with the Tuomo Cusi, and uh, we were able to settle this problem, proving the, the, the vectorial version of this, of this estimate. <coughs> the vectorial version of this estimate I just stated in a different way. I stated emphasizing the fact that these potentials do not only control uh, the size of you, but also the oscillations of you. You see that from this estimate, you can uh, easily get the pointwise estimate. Just you just shift, you just estimate this guy by triangle inequality, and then you put this guy on the right hand side. But this is a finer estimate because this tells you that now the potential does not only control you uh, at the point, but also the oscillations around its average with oscillations on the right hand side. So on. From the, from the dimensional viewpoint, uh, this is a homogeneous estimate. <coughs> and once again, now you can redo the, 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 the same thing of the, that, uh, oh, I mean, uh, essentially this estimate is very general because the, prob the, the theory of measured other problems for in the scalar case has been developed by Bocardo, Galloway, in their school, and by other uh, people, uh, I mean, step-by-step um, -step, uh, proving integrability of U, proving, uh, I mean, several things, Calderon Sigmund estimates, where mu is a bit better than they can prove in a bit, I mean, better results for the estimates. And, uh, but now, uh, all these results that are valid in the scalar case and that they were, I mean, an open issue in the vectorial one, they follow immediately at once by this estimate. Now, this estimate, it recovers up the whole theory developed over many years by these people, but, uh, but, uh, but in the vectorial case. And uh, this is about uh, the U, and uh, the, um, I mean, by far the most difficult case was about the gradient, and about the gradient we get the same thing. This is for, this is for P larger or equal than 2. Then the case P less than 2 is in preparation. But the, the proof of this result is rather, I mean, at work and long. And uh, essentially, um, you start seeing now a first information that leads you to think that, uh, wolf pot that recent wolf potentials do not only control the size of the, of the solution, but they also control um, the, the oscillation of the solutions. And uh, in fact, uh, what we prove in this theorem, in this theorem that uh, we already got uh, in, the, in the scalar case, but now it, uh, it holds in the, in, the, in the full vectorial version, is that in the spirit of the classical uh, potential theory, you can control the fine properties, the fine properties of solutions via uh, the behavior of the risk potential and of both potentials. In particular, a classical topic in the, in the theory of, uh, of um, uh, in potential theory is to know where you can pointwise define solutions. And a classical answer is that when the risk potential is finite, by definition, then u is finite, and it's, uh, it has a precise representative. And now you can get essentially the same. You can get, uh, uh, you, you pick a point, you consider the solution of any quasi-linear equation, and if you know that the, 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 the Wolf potential is finite, then you know that this limit exists and thereby defines pre the so-called precise representative. We know that, uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, functions are defined up to negligible sets as equivalence classes. So the best way you can produce to define the fun uh, an integrable function at a point is to consider the limit of these averages. And whenever it exists, this defines the precise representative. And this tells you that this exists when the risk potential, when the wolf potential is finite. And in particular, this implies immediately that they exist up to a set of p-capacity zero as a W1P function. Without this being a W1P function, of course, that's the point. Because a solution to a measure data problem, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't exist uh, in W1P always. And this is, a, this is really, you can go point by point, and you can see that, uh, that if mu has a certain properties, this exists up to a p-capacity zero uh, function, provided when this is valid. And then the same holds for the gradient, provided now you get, uh, you, you consider the, the, the risk potential. So this, 
uh, it's the reproduction of the classical uh, theory of Choquet, uh, Bellot, and uh, Doub from the 30s and from the 40s that is valid for the Laplacian. Now you can, you can recover it for general systems now. This is this also for systems. For systems with, uh, let me, let me uh, of course, observe one basic difference of this. Uh, while this result holds uh, in the scalar case for any quasi-linear equation, this in the vectorial case holds for the vectorial in Laplacian system. And uh, it must be so, because otherwise, if you consider a general system of this type, uh, and you put a right hand side zero, the estimate would imply that solutions are bounded or the gradient is bounded, while this is not the case by counterexample. So when you, when you shift from, even in the best possible case of a zero right hand side of homogeneous equations, of homogeneous systems, you get that solutions, they develop singularities because of the real vectoriality of the problem. So you really have to stick to the Peter Blasher case or to, I mean, quasi, I mean, one of the structures of this. Okay, and uh, now uh, I would like to say that there is, uh, there is also a more general phenomenon that I will, uh, I will talk about it later. About the oscillations of solutions, because we have seen that this estimate actually is, is able to give you a control of this quantity via this quantity. So this, dimensionally speaking, is an oscillation of the, of, of the solution. So this starts telling you that potentials, they control the oscillations of a solution. So this uh, is going to, uh, to lead to, to a situation where you can prove continuity theorems via potentials. And these are the oscillation bounds. OK, the oscillation bounds can be summarized in the following way. You get a solution now to this object, or to general quasi-linear equations in the scalar case, or to this system in the vectorial case. So the duality is that whenever we are considering the scalar case and considering general quasi-linear equations of this type, and whenever I am considering the vectorial case, I stick to the presence of a system. And then we can prove that if this object goes to zero uniformly with respect to x, then du is continuous. So what does this mean? Let me recall you that uh, i1 of this guy is integral between zero and r of mu of x of b rho x over rho to the n minus one b rho over rho. So whenever this object is finite at a point, we know that it goes to zero when capital R goes to zero, because this is an integral. So if it is finite, then when capital R goes to zero, it goes to zero. In particular, we have already seen that if this is finite, then uh, the gradient is uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a Lebesgue point. Lebesgue point means that in some sense, the oscillations around the points are controlled. They cannot oscillate too much. So this tells you something uh, finer tells you that if this goes to zero uniformly with respect to x, then u is continuous. So in some sense, the fact that this goes to zero uniformly tells you that the, the measure is uh, not concentrating, is not concentrating uniformly around this, this thing. OK, this is a theorem by itself, but it has uh, remarkable consequences. Uh, first of all, it provides a continuity criterion, just uh, uh, a potentially, uh, a potential theoretic continuity criterion. But then it has uh, a few interesting consequences. For instance, um, it holds a so-called nonlinear Stein's theorem. OK, what is nonlinear Stein's theorem? Uh, Stein's theorem, the original Stein's theorem, it's, uh, it's about the limiting case of Sobol FM mapping. We know that if you get a function, dv, that belongs to ln plus epsilon, and this is uh, say we are in our end locally at least, um, then what we know that P embeds into C, 0 alpha, where alpha is 1 minus um, <coughs> n over n minus plus epsilon. 
So in particular, this is uh, epsilon over n plus epsilon. So you get a bit of empirical yield. Now the issue is what happens when epsilon goes to zero. So this is this goes to ln. In ln, this is not the case. Ln just implies that b is so-called minimal, like one carries inequality. But in general, ln is not sufficient to get even boundness of the solution. Okay, so there's an intermediate space which is. Uh, 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 strictly smaller than this guy, but which is larger than every type of this guy that allows for a continuous embedding with explicit modulus of continuity. Uh, but this is uh, the Lorentz space Ln1, and this is a theorem of sign. Ln1 is just described easily by providing this finiteness condition that tells you that the decay of the level sets of G uh, is good enough to make this integral converge. Okay, what is Ln1 about? Uh, it's what you expect. Okay, it follows that if you have Laplacian of u equals to mu in Ln, then u is continuous, because these are interpolation spaces, essentially. Why? Because uh, since these are interpolation spaces, by Calvin and Sigmund, the second derivatives are in Ln1, and therefore, by the previous theorem, the u is in Ln1. Uh, this statement is essentially equivalent to the first one. So they, this, are, this is just another way to state Stein's theorem. This is by inviting. OK, uh, examples of uh, Lorentz functions, because uh, what are examples? OK, what, uh, what happens when you switch to, from this function to ln? A classical example is a log function. A log function, it, uh, a certain power of log belongs to BMO, but it's not bounded. So this is typically a, so you want to get rid of a log. So an example of a ln1 function is essentially this, this one. So you correct it by a log. It's a classical duality. If the log pops up in the singularity, then you, you just drop it by prescribing it as a presence in the, in the, in the, in the, in, in the assigned data. But anyway, this is uh, for any beta. For any beta, this belongs to Lorentz space. OK. Um, then um, Stein's theorem is the following one. It tells you that, uh, and this is sharp, of course. You cannot get better than this. This is the sharp space. If this belongs to Ln one, then this implies that du belongs to C zero. Okay. Um, and then we have uh, that the same thing actually holds for the P-Laplacian equation and even in the case of the system. So this can be considered as a nonlinear degenerate Stein's theorem. And you see once again that uh, <coughs> that uh, there's no difference between the Poisson and the P-Laplacian equation. So this is a nonlinear Stein's theorem that works in the case of equations and eventually in the case of systems. Actually, by the way, this provides an answer to an old, uh, I was told, conjecture by Graz, because it was uh, an open problem to determine the best possible space mu has to belong with to, in order to guarantee that the gradient is bounded, therefore that the solution is locally Lipschitz. And the conjecture was that this condition was independent of p. And this is the condition which is independent of p. So you can see, you can actually uh, confirm uh, with uh, intuition that this condition was uh, independent of p. This was a very old, uh, a very old classical issue about the Peter Blaschen operator. OK. And now um, I would like to present, uh, now I'd like to make a sketch of a first proof of the gradient potential estimate. And uh, because I think it's, uh, it's a proof that it, it has its own interest. Because it also connects to something that eventually later on became very popular, which, are, uh, which is the so-called, uh, I mean, bunch of research dealing with uh, fractional operators. I think that Tuomo Kuhs is talking about fractional operators. Fractional operators are 
I mean, equations of this type, you take, uh, and now you want to analyze the, the, the regularity of these types of equations. Where well, this is a fraction of power of the Laplacian. Or more in general, you get, uh, you get weak solutions of uh, equations like this. <coughs> And you put your kernel, and it is zero for every right? zero for every for every test function phi. But you put your measurable kernel. Okay. Um, what about this fully fractional approach? So I go back to the case p equals to two, and so this is uh, okay. We have a better proof now, but this can be of some interest because it connects uh, a few a few things that we to. Uh, I mean, a few a few things of the theory. Um, and this is the, the first theorem that uh, I proved several years ago, actually almost 10 years ago. And you take a solution of this equation and you can pointwise bound every component of the gradient by the risk potential with the same component here in the average. But I mean, think about that the gradient can be bounded by the I1 risk potential. So I want to give a, a brief sketch of this proof. Um, and this, of course, implies that uh, this formula. OK, so this is a gradient bound. In particular, when mu is equal to 0, this is the usual n infinity L1 bound for, for solutions of harmonic time, of, of, of for some equation. OK, how do you prove uh, the estimate when mu is equal to 0? So uh, when mu is equal to 0, so you first prove that you can, uh, you can uh, differentiate the solution. So the solution is not only W12, but the solution is uh, the solution is uh, uh, the solution is in W11. The solution is in W1. And uh, then you differentiate the equation and then you discover that every component of the of the gradient is a solution of a linear equation. And the linear equation has measurable coefficients because it incorporates the gradient which is a priori, uh, I mean, unknown to be continuous. It eventually, it is eventually continuous. This is really the core of, uh, of the standard the Georgi's theory. So at this stage, you can immediately um, stop because now you are in the framework of the georgi nash moser theory and then you can get a gradient bound because the gradient is itself a solution and the, of a linear elliptic equation with measurable coefficients and then you get the, you, then you get the bound. In turn, you go into the proof of the Georgi Nash Moser theorem, and you re, you remember that this is a consequence of Cacciopoli type inequality uh, that holds for the gradient. So you can get uh, you can take the component of the gradient, you take the level set where this is the maximum between this is a, the standard the Georgi type truncation. and then. Once you know that this, once you know that this holds, once you know that this holds, then you can start the Georgi's type of uh, uh, iteration. This is a, a so-called Cacciopoli type inequality because you see here you, uh, you you are controlling a second derivative by a first derivative. So a higher order object is controlled by a lower order object, and this is the first information that comes from being a solution. Eventually, how does it work? Then this, this will control the uh, uh, Sobolev embedding a higher power of the gradient, and then a nonlinear iteration starts, a geometric iteration starts, leading to the, to the fact that a certain, uh, at a certain cut, the level set, the, 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 the truncated function becomes uniformly zero, and this means that the, at a certain height, uh, the gradient is, uh, I mean, that the gradient is, is below that, that certain height. Okay, now imagine that you have a measure on the right hand side. Instead of getting zero, you get mu, and then you immediately see that the problem fails. This this program fails because the because when the right hand side is a measure, you cannot even get that the gradient is in W one one. You don't get differentiability. <coughs> but if you don't get differentiability, we have seen that you get uh, fractional differentiability. We have seen yesterday. 
So you get that the gradient is in W sigma 1 for every sigma less than 1. This means this. And yesterday I proved, uh, okay, I didn't prove actually, I stated the following result that tells you that in this situation, if you are not in W11, you are almost there. Now the idea is that you can replace Kachopoli, the standard Kachopoli type inequality where you control second derivatives by first derivatives uh, with a new fractional Kachopoli type inequality where you control fractional derivatives of the gradient by the gradient itself. And this is it. Essentially, you prove that Kachopoli inequalities are robust enough to resist to, let's say, all kinds of environments. In particular, when the right-hand side is a measure, you can prove that uh, you get a Kachopoli type inequality of the Georges type, therefore with the truncation, but where you, you are not controlling, uh, you are not controlling the, the, the second derivatives, but the sigma derivatives. So you have picked up derivative. If you, if you compare this with the classical one, you see that on the right hand side, the additional term appears, naturally appears, because now the, the, the equation is not homogeneous. You, you are not in L2, but you are in L1 because you are now dealing with the solution of a measured data equation and the gradient is not assumed, supposed to be in L2, it's not in the energy space, so you have to formulate it in L1, but otherwise the spirit is the same. You can control uh, uh, fractional derivatives instead of a first derivative, like this. And this is, uh, let's say, the non-trivial part of the proof. This one. This one. Yeah. Well, it formally is this one. Yeah, it's equal to that. I mean, yeah, uh, you know that this is not the usual notation, right? Because it's, this is just assumed used when this guy is a fractional guy, but uh, it's a, it's a fraction. It's not an integer. But I stated in this way to emphasize the similarity. So it's uh, it's uh, it's just a graphic graphical trick. I mean. It's, OK. And now we know that uh, exactly in the spirit of the George's theory, once you know, once you know a fractional, uh, I mean, a uh, uh, Kachopoli type inequality, then everything comes from the Kachopoli type inequality. You forget about uh, the fact that uh, you're dealing with a solution, and you're just dealing with, uh, uh, with the fact that you have, a, uh, you have a Kachopoli type inequality. And now the next theorem is the following one. OK, this is the, let's say, this is what I was saying. I mean, this is the similarity between this, I mean, the classical fractional and uh, the new Kachopoli inequality, the classical one. And 2L2 and 1L1 and 0 to 1 and 0 to 6. They improve. Not from, you, you don't jump from 0 to 1, but from 0 to sigma. Any sigma is, uh, is OK now. Any sigma is OK. OK. And then the second theorem is the following one. Take any function which satisfies this Kachopoli type inequality on a pointwise level. Any function. So you don't need that this function is solving anywhere, anything. So it just, you, this function just comes along with the property of being a solu uh, of, of, of satisfying this inequality. And at one point, and then at this, for every radii i. And then if this holds, then at that point you can bound this with the risk potential. And now you combine the two. Because you know that the gradient satisfies this, and then since it satisfies this, then it holds this one. Then this one holds. It is very, it is very straightforward. So this is a full reproduction of uh, the classical thing. But the fact that you start from a fraction of the Georgi type inequality. And how do you do at this stage? At this stage, in the classical the George's theory, then you start a nonlinear iteration saying that this quantity, I mean, the first derivatives control the Sobolev embedding, a higher power of W. Here you use fractional Sobolev embedding to still control a higher power, but a smaller power than in the uh, integer case of, of W. And then you start the same geometric iteration. Since any geometric iteration converge, converges, 
then you don't need sigma to be one. That's the trick. You need any sigma because, uh, okay, of course, the smaller sigma is, uh, the slower the, the, the iteration will converge. But you don't care. It's important. The, the only important fact is that it's eventually converging. That's the that's 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 the that, that's the the idea. Okay. It, um, now connection with the fractional operators. Uh, essentially, at the same time that this paper was written, uh, then there was a paper by Gaffarelli and Basseur, by Gaffarelli and Basseur, which is uh, I think on Annals of Math. Gaffarelli. That uh, that essentially they they pursue the same strategy of the second part of the proof. From the fractional I mean, um, equation, they derive a Cacioppoli type inequality. And now this is, uh, let's, say, um, let's say, this is the point where the two things very much differ. Because I start from a local problem, and then I get a fractional inequality. Uh, I mean, a nonlinear local problem, and then I get a fractional inequality. Here, you use natural, you're immediately getting one line uh, fractional inequality because the problem is fractional in itself. And then after this fractional the judge is, I mean fractional the judge, a fractional Cacioppoli inequality holds, then uh, in both cases a, a fractional the judge's iteration starts. Essentially with the same basic idea, underlying idea that you can get you can get the iteration, the geometric convergence by a, a, a fractional sub here, uh, the point is that you, you start from a fractional Cacioppoli inequality because the problem is fractional. Here, you start from a fractional, you come, you arrive at a fractional Cacioppoli inequality because the problem is not differentiable in the classical case. So you, you step a bit back, you get some sigma, and then you, you, you straight on go to the, to the variant. OK, and now I will uh, we'll talk about more general, I mean, more general situations where this philosophy of, uh, of uh, estimating everything via potentials can be extended. And now we go to a fully nonlinear interlude to show how this, uh, this approach can be, I mean, can be person to I mean, to get estimates for fully nonlinear equations. OK. Uh, what we proved together with Totti Daskalopoulos and Tomo Kuhs is the following uh, fully nonlinear Stein theorem that tells you exactly what Stein's theorem tells you, but now you replace the degenerate P Laplacian with, uh, with a fully nonlinear, with any fully nonlinear elliptic equation. Uh, this is essentially the borderline result of a famous result of Caffarelli that tells you that uh, what you expect if the f is in Ln plus epsilon then the U is in elder is elder continuous. And this is classical for the Laplacian. So Caffarelli's great contribution was to show that this perturbation theory, and this was also shown, I think, by Tudinger, um, uh, was to show that this also holds, this was actually simultaneously shown by Caffarelli and Tudinger. Caffarelli in this paper, he has also the perturbation theory about calvin sigmund theory. And then they proved this, this result. Uh, which is dimensionally speaking the obvious one, because in the in, because you see in the Laplacian case, in the case of the Laplacian, if you get Laplacian of u equals to mu and equals to f, and this belongs to ln plus epsilon, then you can replace saying that the second derivatives belong to ln plus epsilon, and then you can conclude that some theorem. Um, and this is a fully nonlinear version, borderline version, and this is the usual Lorentz space. Okay? We have seen it's the classical one when you look for a, a gradient contiguity. Okay, the key to the proof is a new potential type estimate. Be a new potential. Okay, what is the bad thing about these fully linear equations? You might you might you might think that also here there's a there's a potential estimate working on, but actually this is not the case. Because these fully nonlinear equations are something which is not well defined when the right hand side is not at least in Ln or it's in a close to Ln. So you get a fully nonlinear equations, then the notion is a viscose, the one of viscosity solution, and then this, um, uh, this is achievable and this is possible provided the right hand side is in Ln or is in Ln minus epsilon with epsilon very small. This is essential, the range, uh, the domain of applicability of so called 
uh, Alexander of Bagelman puts this principle, uh, which is the key to the, the, the analysis of uh, regularity of solutions to fully linear equations. Otherwise, <coughs> this doesn't hold, and nothing holds by that, for example. So in particular, potential estimates are ruled out because potential estimates, they would assume that the right-hand side is a measure for Ln, L1. Here, you have to be in Ln. So the idea is to cook up a new potential that doesn't start from measures or L1, but starts exactly from this phase. Okay, write down the risk potential in the case the measure is a function, so it has a density which is in L1, then the risk potential is nothing but this. You can check, because you see this is 1 over rho to the n, but exactly as in the risk potential. The risk potential is this one, in the case of a function, it's a mu d rho, over rho n minus 1 d rho over rho. So this rho cancels with this one, and if this is a function, this is nothing by the average over d rho. So this is the risk potential in case mu is a function. No, no I mean, no, no trick. Absolutely, absolutely no trick at this stage. But since I cannot start with uh, something which is in L1, then I do Elder, and if I do Elder, I do the following triviality. Then I define this new, I mean, modified risk potential. I would like to stress the, the role of this modified risk potential because it will come back later on. So this is just another potential which is actually a Wolf potential. You can rewrite in terms of Wolf potentials, but I write, I call it a modified risk potential because uh, uh, it has the same homogeneity properties of the risk potential, and then you can see these homogeneity properties just coming from filters in the pool. So this is not no trick here, zero. So the difference between this guy and this guy is that uh, now you you can start from a Q, which is exactly this exponent, which is which has been universally determined in a paper by Escariazza. Scariata shows that you can extend the validity of certain results from Ln <coughs> to Ln minus a universal epsilon that depends just on the ellipticity constants. And then we prove the following, uh, the following uh, pointwise estimate, whose idea is very simple. You cannot use the risk potential, therefore you use the modified risk potential, and then you get another uh, let's say, uh, estimate for, it's just the idea, the proof is not that difficult, but it's just the idea that uh, of the general path you have to follow to get uh, a full linear analog of all these potential estimates. So the full linear analog works for, provided you are using now modified potentials. If you're using modified potentials, then you can also prove, yeah, that's the yes, we had the exponent talking about. Consequences, if you get this Mori type condition, then the U is in BMO. Now you see, you can pursue the whole program of getting, I mean, estimates of all kinds that, are, that were even unknown for fooling on linear equations just uh, by by abstract nonsense. Why? Because uh, this new potential has the same properties of the risk potential, uh, and it can be rewritten as a Wolf potential. Then you know how Wolf potentials behave, and then everything reshuffles and recombines at the end and provides you with the results you are going to, uh, to, to wish for. You are wishing for. Uh, for instance, if you get this, you get the DOE CPMO. In particular, if F belongs to Ln infinity, then the u is in BMO. Moreover, if, if this goes to zero uniformly, then the u is in BMO. You get, these are, let's say, sample corollaries of the result. This is a, a borderline case of a, of a very well known theorem of Caffarelli that tells you that if you are in a Mori space, then the u is in, uh, is in the continuous. So you see, alpha here is uh, larger than zero. Here is zero, and therefore you get uh, you get from uh, uh, Hilder continuity straight on to BMO. BMO is a is a space of bounded being oscillation functions that I showed in the first lecture. 
In particular, you can get one uh, recent result of a very interesting paper by Teixeira, uh, simultaneous essentially, uh, where he proved that if f is in Ln, then u is log Lipschitz, then this satisfies this. But we proved that if uh, actually this belongs to Ln infinity, which is weaker, then the u is in BMO, and this implies log Lipschitz. So it's uh, essentially, if you step up to the gradient, then you can recover things by inventing. And uh, the, the, uh, this interesting papers by they share where we prove so, I mean, um, regularity results for fully nonlinear elliptic equations in borderline spaces. And in particular, we can also prove the following fact that I forgot to mention, that all these results come along uh, a corollary of the proof of this theorem that tells you that if uh, you get essentially as in the Peter Plasha case, and these are two results I would like to, to talk about. Yeah, this is uh, not here. And uh, the result is that, now there are two results that I wanted to mention, but they are not on the slides. If rho goes to zero, and this is the modified potential, uniformly with respect to x, so uniformly with respect to x, and this implies that u is continuous. And in particular, this implies the corollary is useful about the continuity of the gradient. And in particular, you can see why. You can see that uh, Exactly as in the case of the pre and if uh, f belongs to Ln1, then it's uh, two lines to show that this is satisfied. Exactly as in the case of the pre In the pre you can see that this implies that this goes to zero uniformly, and also the risk potential goes to zero uniformly. So it's a general philosophy. You just, the, the idea is that every problem has its own potential. And then once you discover the, the role, the, the right potential, then you, get, you can go straight on in all, to all kinds of results. So it's a uh, general fact. For instance, the philosophy is very pervasive because there's uh, another theorem. Going back to the P Laplacian. For the Pila Plasian, we have seen that uh, if you get this, this equation, then essentially what is the, what is the why you can pointwise bound the gradient to the P minus 1 via the risk potential? This is the thing that goes better at blackboard. Plus, I mean, energies. But just consider everything on our end at this stage. So you don't get the verges. And you can get just the I1 risk potential on the whole domain. So how does it come? You essentially, what you do, you apply formally, you do dimensional analysis, you apply formally I1 to both sides. And if you apply to both sides, you get, uh, and you switch to the modulus, you get that this is I1 cancels the divergence because it's essentially a, an integration. And then this gives you this, and therefore this is how you get to the, to the I1 estimate. So it's the, the same equation as I showed you before that tells you why the, the, the estimate is true. In particular, here you also see why you cannot get an estimate via risk potentials for U, but you meet both potentials. And you know that this is Kirpelayan and Valisa estimate, which is optimal. If you go on doing this, now you want to extract u from this, this, this inequality. You see, up to now we extracted the u by applying a risk potential, which therefore it's an integration and formally cancels the divergence. So we extracted the gradient. Now we want to extract u. If we want to extract u, now what we have here, we have p minus 1, so we have to do this. And now we can formally integrate again. So I1 again, that cancels a, uh, dimensionally, I mean, 
the gradient operator, and therefore you get that u is less than or equal than i1, i1. But what is this? This is uh, nothing but having a Mazia potential, which is equivalent for p larger than 2, and for all the range of inequalities to 1 over p mu. And this is keep aligning the Maliza statement. And it is therefore sharp. So, so you see, the, the, why you need proof potentials for u, and why you need Ries potentials for the gradient? Because in the case of the gradient, the equation is a nonlinear equation in the gradient, but can be conceived as a linear equation in a nonlinear vector field of the gradient. So this is a linear equation in this quantity, in the whole quantity. And therefore, a risk potential appears. But if you want to go up to u, then both potentials appear. This philosophy is very much pervasive, because then this leads you to think that whatever you have, whatever you have inside the divergent sign, then there's a risk potential estimate. And in fact, this is a deep theorem of Paolo Baloni. I think it's published in Kalkvar. or one year ago, I don't know, one of these years. And the Paolo Bayoni analyzes uh, um, uh, the most general family you can think about. It's a family introduced by Lieberman, but it actually relates the previous work of Leon Simon related to minimal surfaces. And then he analyzes things like this. <laughs> U over U, uh, where there are certain <coughs> properties of the, the function G making it elliptic. This is actually also in the work of Ullenberg. So you see, if you now do the same thing, you apply I1, then you apply I1, and IY cancels this guy, and you would expect for an estimate that tells you that g of the u can be controlled by i1 of mu, and this is actually Paolo Bayoni's theorem that proves this one, and whose proof is considerably more delicate and uh, technically difficult than uh, the proof of the theorems we are talking about. And this is really the, the peak of technicality for this, for these kinds of, uh, of operators. But this tells you that, uh, okay, Bayoni's theorem tell, tells that uh, this is the most, I mean, the philosophy is really pervasive that acts uh, at any level. Yeah. So. This is the theorem. OK. Uh, what time is it? Yeah. Still 25 minutes I have, right? I still 25. I still have 25. We're not going to have a break. Yeah, I can continue up to the very end. Yeah. And then we'll finish okay. Okay. And now we have seen that. Uh, okay. The, the prototype theorem about oscillations I I uh, I presented up to now tells you the following fact. By the way, by only also proves that if also in this case, or if the right uh, if the risk potential goes to zero, uniformly then the gradient is continuous. So let me recall you the following fact that uh, works for even for systems. If the right hand side, okay, the potential of the right hand side goes to zero uniformly with respect to x, then this implies that the u is C0 alpha, C0. <coughs> In particular, this holds where um, when mu it belongs to Lorentz space L1. <clears throat> okay, this is a, a qualitative information. Qualitative means that you know that the measure is concentrating smoothly in such a way that this potential can go to zero uniformly. Uniform. But doesn't provide any quantitative estimate on the rate of oscillations. So you see there's no modulus of continuity. Just saying that u is continuous, then you know zero. Now we want to make this more precise, and we go to uh, we go to what uh, Tomokuzi and myself called universal potential estimates. Universal potential. Okay, the, the 
the idea of the universal potential estimate estimates is to show that uh, okay uh, that there's a whole world behind these kinds of theorems because they, they tell you that you can control oscillations of the gradient or oscillations also of you if you replace this by the Wolf potentials but then you can have a quantitative version a pointwise quantitative version of these theorems uh, and this quantitative version is described by uh, potentials too exactly in the same way potential where describing size properties of the functions that, that is uh, pointwise um, um, inequalities. These are the universal potential estimates. Okay, we need uh, let. It's a typo. How many typos you discover when you lecture? Amazing. Um, so once again, we start from this. We observe the following elementary inequalities that holds for the Green's function kernel. And therefore, this leads you to think that u x minus u y can be pointwise bounded by the sum of these two by integration times this. Not very difficult. Essentially, you can uh, represent u via the fundamental solution instead of estimating u at one point, you take the differences, and these differences can be estimated in the following way. So potentials appear, but intermediate potentials appear. Okay, and now we find convenient to use the following definition by the Lorentz Sharpley. So the Lorentz Sharpley in 82 introduced these functions, these function spaces, they call Calderon spaces, and uh, actually they were born observing that you can make uh, upside nonsense out of some I mean, very older techniques by Campanato. In fact, they use, essentially they, they are making abstract, uh, uh, abstract nonsense on certain Campanato's proofs to, make, to build the definition. And the definition is, very, is the following one. So we say that D belongs to C0 Q, if the oscillations of B can be bounded by this difference, as it were, Hilder continuous function, but now you're replacing the Hilder continuous semi norm with, uh, with the sum of two functions at two different points where M is uh, uh, an LQ function. So you know that uh, Hilder continuity means that here you have a constant, or if you like, you have a bounded function. Now you have an LQ function. So sure, you are locally describing, but actually, no locally describing the potential blow up of the Hilder semi norm with an LQ function. So this is just another way to say differentiability. It's not very difficult to see that these spaces are very much, uh, in, uh, I mean, linked to Nikolsky spaces or to fractional Sobolev spaces. They, uh, they are, they are, all of them are equivalent by tilting at alpha of a small epsilon, as usual. So why these are convenient? Because you see, um, uh, this reduces the, the non-locality of the definition to a minimal status. You don't need to use a Gallardo semi norm or an integral, you just use two points. The non-locality is just you use two points instead of one point. This definition has been eventually used also by other people, by Pio Dreiwasch, a similar definition to define Sobolev spaces in, me, uh, on metric measure spaces, and therefore there's a, a very deep Iwash theory on this. Uh, Sobolev spaces on metric spaces. Essentially, the definition is that you replace this by uh, any general other metric. In fact, this is a distance again. Okay. So, in some sense, M represents the alpha order. Uh, so, it's a, let's say, it's a replacement of the alpha order derivative. It's a, the best possible local replacement of the alpha derivative you can think at this stage. Okay, a few samples of universal potential estimates. This is the estimate, this is the first uh, universal potential estimate. Look here. You get ux minus uy, then you get this guy. Just forget about this integral here. You forget about this integral here. You can forget about it because, uh, I mean, this is the usual uh, and then you get the, the, you have the sum of two potentials. So this tells you that for a solution of an equation like this, you can bound the oscillations via potentials. 
at two different points. So this means that you are at point one. So if you remember the definition of a Calderon space, the definition of a Calderon space is that uh, you have two x minus two y less than or equal than m x plus m y x minus y to the alpha, and then m now is uh, the wolf potential. So the wolf potential essentially bounds pointwise bounds the fraction of derivative. So when uh, when alpha is equal to zero, we get Kirchhoff and Mali estimate. When alpha is equal to 1, we get uh, the estimate I proved with Duzar, which is almost sharp. So essentially, we see that for alpha equal to 0, we get Kirchhoff and Mali. For alpha equal to 1, we get the gradient estimate. In between, we get uh, a new family of estimates that are, uh, that are bound to control the oscillation, the, os the oscillations of, uh, of the solution. And in particular, now, you can do the same thing. I want to know, for instance, when or where uh, u is locally held or continuous with this exponent. So I forget about the solution. I just look at the potential. If the potential is locally finite, then it's held or continuous. I want to know if a solution is, uh, is in a fractional sum of space, so, or in a Calderon space. I just look where this potential is, when this potential is in LQ, and therefore I conclude with, uh, with the thing. So it's the usual thing. So you see, this estimate is, uh, uh, goes up to zero, from 0 to 1 uniformly. It catches up the sharp estimate of Kirchhoff and Mali when alpha is equal to 0. It doesn't catch the sharp, the sharp risk potential estimate because it cannot for alpha equal to 1, because you get a booth potential, but it catches up the other borderline in the family of risk potentials. So, it's a, so this estimate actually also shows that the two estimates the gradient estimate and the, and the estimate and the estimate for u are two particular borderline cases of a universal family of interpolating estimates uh, that control all types of all types of oscillations in between. <coughs> and this is what it is actually saying. You see, the estimate tells exa exa exactly that you are controlling the alpha of the derivative here, the potential. So when alpha is equal to zero, you go back to U and to Kirchhoff and Mali estimate. When alpha is equal to 1, you get back the, the, the gradient estimate. When mu is equal to 0, it reduces to the classical estimate that you get by scaling by the George's theory. And in the classical uh, case, p equals to 2, it, go, it gives you back the estimate I showed you for the Laplacian. But now it works for any general quasi linear equation. So essentially, you, you, you have once again linearized the theory, not only with respect to size conditions, but also to oscillations conditions. So essentially, you, you, this gives you any type of regularity you might like to have in terms of oscillations, any function space, then it's included here. In fact, uh, there are several papers I have discovered recently that they prove certain, I mean, single properties of solutions without that the authors are realizing that they also follow from this, uh, from this, from this estimate. They are interesting, of course, in the, because they show up with other methods and they are interesting by themselves, but they should, uh, I mean, they also compare well, I mean, probably to these kinds of estimates. Okay. Um, uh, if you want to catch, then, the other borderline case, because you see the first estimate catches you sharply the, the first borderline case of the wolf potential, but not the other one. Then you get this other estimate. This other estimate blows up when alpha goes to zero because it can it, it must, because it, it would show up with uh, with uh, with a better estimate than Kirchhoff and Maris, which is optimal. Therefore, it has to blow up. But this is exactly the the, the, the rate of blow up. So when alpha goes to one. Then you get uh, you get the other the risk potential. So this uh, this is the other the, the other estimate. The first estimate is sharp at zero and nearly sharp at one. This is sharp at one and uh, shows up the the, the, the the sharp I mean blow, blowing up at zero. So it's the other way around. This is just to complete the theory. Of course, you can go beyond. There is a much more general fact behind all these things 
and this is uh, uh, this is described via the fractional maximal operator. So the fractional maximal operator is the following one: when beta is equal to zero, this is the usual uh, maximal operator by adding the root, and this is the fractional sharp maximal operator. All kinds of uh, <coughs> operators considered also by the word sharp. You can prove the following fact, in, indeed. And this is really now uniform. You can prove that uh, uh, the fractional sharp maximal operator of u, which is controlled by the one of u, by, uh, by the standard um, fractional operator of u via Poincare's inequality, is itself controlled by a potential uniformity. And this implies the previous estimate I showed you before. This is the stronger estimate. You see where is the point. There's no blow up here. This is uniform. But there's no blow up because you are uh, controlling actually less at zero. You are controlling the fractional sharp maximal operator. Therefore, you are not controlling u, but you are controlling the oscillations of u. And this is slightly less. Slightly less because it uh, means that you are not getting an infinity. You are getting BMO. And the difference between BMO and then infinity, it's a log, which is in terms of matching cabbage, which is exactly the difference between a potential and a potential with one over alpha. That's the classical matching cabbage blow up when you consider limiting cases. So everything, even, I mean, at this stage, even the blow up is sharp, in, it's in the sharp range. So this is the game, the typical game of things. The third universal estimate. So it's actually a counterintuitive. Something is universal should be unique, but here there's one first, second, third. And uh, why it, it, it implies the previous one? Because there's an abstract lemma of Campagnato, the Gordon Sharp play, that tells you that you can always bound the differences of V by sums of, uh, of, uh, of uh, maximal oper sharp maximal operators. And you see where alpha blows up. So if you want to just to control if you just want to control the, max, the fractional operator, then you don't get any alpha. When from the fractional operator you go back to u, then alpha appears. And that's how you prove the previous estimate. You actually prove this estimate, and then you get the, the other one by, control, by estimating u via the maximal operator, and the maximal operator is estimated by this object, via this lemma. This is exactly the, 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 range of, uh, the range of things that you are dealing with. And this imp essentially implies everything. OK, these are the estimates for, for, uh, these are the estimates for, for you. But you, may, you might ask for more. Why? Because uh, if you are now dealing with uh, with the P Laplacian operator, you know that the maximal regularity of solutions to this equation is uh, the U belongs to C0 alpha M, where this is a maximal exponent whose identity, sharp identity, is not known up to now, but there exists. For sure, this is less than 1. This is never 1, like other examples of real but there is this sharp exponent. So you might like to have also oscillation estimates in terms of potentials for the gradient up to the best possible case, of course. So you wonder if there are oscillation estimates for solutions to this for the gradient. And these oscillation estimates, of course, cannot go beyond the, this maximum exponent. And this is the fourth universal potential estimate for the gradient, and this has been proved by, by Tuomo and myself again, and this shows you uh, exactly what you, what you believe. It's again, again the above potentials. When alpha goes to 1, you catch back the, you catch back the, the, bull, the sharp bull potential that you expect. Otherwise, uh, you can still do the same for oscillations of the gradient, of course, not going up to the maximal the maximal uh, exponent. Because otherwise, this would contradict the maximum regularity. 
you go up to the maximal regulite, you go, I mean, you can, con you can the, the idea is that you can extend this uh, potential estimate as long as you can. So, there are now, there is now a universal family of estimates. That's only, I mean, we do not pretend to be, to go to risk potentials, we just use both potentials which is enough for, I mean, 99% of the, of, the, of the issues. And then we see that there's a universal potential estimate starting from C0, let's say, L infinity, to C1 alpha m, that's the maximum regularity of the gradient. So here there is this Kirpelein and Emily estimate. Here there is, a, let's say, Lipschitz. And this is a, the estimate I have with, uh, with Frank Tuzar. This is the, the maximum regularity of Wollenberg with Alcelon. Here you see the, the, the Palagian and Maria estimate. Here you see, and here you see this universal, universal unit by uh, Tuomo Cusi and myself. So that's, uh, so you, can, you can see that uh, these two estimates, this estimate was actually the opening of the uh, of all the rest, and then you can prove the gradient, then you can prove these are just two particular cases of a more general family of estimates that you can hook up at this stage. And they, they are bound to catch up all kinds of regularity in between. So this uh, gives, uh, let's say, a unified viewpoint on the regularity theory of the non homogeneous P Laplacian uh, equation. Okay, uh, parabolic potential theory. How long do I see that? Five minutes. Five minutes? Yeah. Sure. 11, yeah. 11, yeah. Okay, I think this is a good place to stop. So tomorrow we can go to potential, uh, parabolic potential theory and then uh, to finalize with partial regularity and potential. So, okay, it's okay.